The heavens tell the glory of God, and creation and proclaims the knowledge of God. From the rising of the sun to its setting, and all the earth witness to the presence of God. Today, may the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be an acceptable sacrifice to God, our rock, and our redeemer. Let us worship God, the Lord our God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. As we gather here in our worship today, in our lives, Lord, give us hearts filled with passion. Fulfill the desire of our hearts to meet you in worship. Fulfill the desire of our heart that we go into your world with love. May worship transform our lives, that we may transform your world in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, as Jesus worshipped you in the temple, so we come to this holy place, in our different places where we are. We worship you now through words, song, music, praying for our world, ourselves, and one another. Thank you for being our God and for loving us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I will call Brother Ben to come and do the reading of the Word of God, coming from the book of John, chapter 2, verses 13 to 25. Morning, everyone. It's uh, great to be here again and to be able to read the Word. I just find it so good reading the Word of God. There's just so much uh, truth and life that comes from it. And, uh, yeah, to be able to read this to you today is... Um, just such a privilege. So as Johnson mentioned, it's John 2, um, 13 to 25, and it's about Jesus clears the temple courts. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at the table exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of, coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. Wow, what a man of authority. So this is the word of the Lord this week. and. Um, can't wait to hear what Johnson's got to share with us and the, the message we'll hear. So, yeah, get ready. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Ben, for the reading of the Word of God. And uh, this morning I've decided to share with you, brothers and sisters, on the theme, A New Clean Temple Shall Arise. A New Clean Temple Shall Arise. If you ever had one of those times when you had just had enough, one of those times that you have held your breath, you have turned away, maybe many times because you just don't like what you see going on. But it then finally come to the point that you just can't turn away anymore. You had enough and you decided you just can't be silent any longer. So you do something fairly dramatic. Looking back on it, it may not have been all that smart, but you had dead enough and you did it. Can you remember one of those times? Take just a moment and search your memory and maybe the story about Jesus cleaning the temple will make a little more sense. 
But before we actually begin the story, let's recognize some of the confusion around this incident and get it out of the way so we can hear what the story actually has to say to us. Sometimes we get distracted by things and miss out what the story is actually trying to tell us. There is the additional problem of finding this story in the beginning of the fourth gospel. Whereas the other evangelist, Matthew, Mark, Luke, place it only at the Holy Week, at the beginning of his passion. Could it be true that Jesus cleansed the temple twice? Is John right and the others wrong? Or is it the other way around? What is John trying to say? Or would there be another reason why John places the story where he uses, does it? There is good reason to think that it is the letter. So the story of Jesus cleansing the temple helps us to understand several very important aspects of the church and its worship. The context and the importance of the temple. Let me just give you a brief context and the importance of the temple. So the evangelist relates for us that this occasion was a Passover festival. The Passover attracted worshippers to Jerusalem from all over the world. They came speaking different languages and carrying foreign monies. So enterprising merchants had set up booths and stores in the temple to accommodate the travelers coming to worship who needed to exchange their monies in order to pay their temple taxes and make their contributions. Others were busy selling animals to be used in the sacrifices. So to be sure, there was a great commotion and excitement. One can imagine the carnival character of those festival days as travelers found relatives old friends among the main consumers who populated the prince of the temple. So the temple area covered 35 acres. It had originally been built by Solomon about 956 BC, 50 BC, but was burned to the ground by Nebuchadnezzar in 587 BC. So the temple was rebuilt under the Bible in 516 BC. It was des desecrated and stripped by Antiochus, Epiphanes in 168 BC and cleansed and restored by Judas Magad Bees in 165 BC. So the temple in which Jesus found himself amid the, this cattle and many sharks was the glorious temple began by Herod the Great who began the work in 20 BC. It was not yet completed while Jesus was there and was not finished until 68 AD. So a short time before his complete destruction in 70 AD, the Herodian temple was extremely lavish and more beautiful than the temple of Solomon. And that's why you could hear them say, how can you say you can rebuild this temple in a short time when it has taken us 46 years to build this temple? So with this long history of the temple in the life of the Hebrew people, one can imagine how important a shrine this was. From the very beginning of the Hebrew people, sacred places had been imported to the patriarchs. Then the tabernacle, the traveling shrine of a tent, had been the center of the life of the Hebrew community. However, just as the people longed for a monarch with a throne, as other people's had, they wanted a permanent shrine. So the most popular of their kings, King David, gathered the materials for his son Solomon to build the first temple on that holy site, Mount Moria, where Abraham offered to sacrifice his son Isaac. So the temple had always symbolized for the people the presence of the most holy God, Yahweh. It is, that is why it was so important that after each time the temple was destroyed, that it be restored to proclaim once again the assured presence of the Almighty and Holy One of Israel. Whenever the temple was destroyed, they will rebuild it as quickly as possible. Why? Because it signifies, it symbolizes the presence of God to them. So it was especially gratifying for the people that Herod the Great should have given so much attention to the restoration of the temple in such an extravagant manner. Herod had done much to promote the Hellenistic or Greek culture with their special buildings. However, he also carried the favor of the Jews by investing so much in the building of their shrine. <coughs> Excuse me. So the people were grateful to worship in Herod's temple. Regardless of Herod's motives, the temple was the center of their life and helped to define what it meant to be a Jew. So it gave shape and form not only to a Hebrew worship, but also to their entire culture. 
So the table was considered sacred. The heir of the tabernacle. It was the house of God, an earthly counterpart of the heavenly sanctuary. In Exodus 25, verse 40. So here the Ark of the Covenant containing the tablets of the law was housed. The table was the place where God dwelled in the midst of his people. Recognizing the centrality of the temple, I will come up with this one. The shock of challenging an old system. That is what Jesus found. So recognize the centrality of the temple and the joyous character of that festival moment. You can imagine what kind of shock waves ran through the temple and the entire city of Jerusalem. When this controversial rabbi created the disturbance he did in the temple area. It appears this happened at the beginning of the feast. When the greatest excitement had to do with the preparations so that the commerce had to be at its height. Into that busy crowd, Jesus rides with a homemade whip of cause and strike out wild people, animals to put them into a root. So the whip is a sign of both authority and force. Entrained unrighteousness is not dealt with passively. Sometimes you need to do it in a radical way. The whole house must be cleansed if true worship is to be restored. It must be cleaned. So the reason that the evangelist John includes this story at the very beginning of his gospel is because he wants to show throughout his gospel that Jesus gave new shape and meaning to worship life of the people of God. So in this very story, John is able to set the stage of all that is to follow in explaining the sacramental character of worship in the life of the church. Therefore, it is quite striking when Jesus shouts as he confronts those selling the little doves for sacrifice, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. Those were his words. Jesus had come to replace the sacrificial system of the Hebrew covenant by making the once and for all sacrifice on a cross. So quite symbolically, Jesus was driving out the old system. However, at the same time, he was making it clear that he was highly displeased that people had made their sacrifices and their worship more commercial. So he was dealing with all those things. So the disciples were really shaken by what they witnessed Jesus doing. This does not appear to be the same Jesus who is gentle, considerate otherwise. However, the evangelist said that if they remembered that what it was written, zeal for your house will consume you. So they recalled Psalm 69 verse 9, which they saw Jesus fulfilling in the Old Testament. So they understood at that moment Jesus was making a rightful claim to his father's house. That meant he clearly identified himself as God's son, who was linked to all that God had revealed in the covenant. Jesus is bringing to an end a way of life and thought. Israel's issues are to be replaced. Who is going to take? Jesus is now taking the place. So the normal business of sacrifice will be unnecessary. Now that he has come, Jesus is breaking open and deepening the whole reality of worship. He is the new place. He is the new temple. He is the new house in which the glory of God will break forth. So, with Jesus coming, there is no earthly building where God lives that we can hang on it. Only Jesus. There is no earthly building where we can put our focus. The new day has come. He opened for us the way to Father's heart. So, for Christians, the building we are in is not the real church. The church is the body of believers. We are the church. And who is the center of the church is Jesus Christ. So he is he's telling people not to be focused on the temple, but to be focused on him. So the people in praise taken back but quizzical. What sign can you show us for doing this? They asked it. Jesus answered, destroy this temple. And in three days I will raise it up, up again. That same the people, really, they responded, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it up in three days. Who are you? 
So the heralds had been at all this time and it was still not finished. And Jesus thought he could rebuild it in three days? That was ridiculous. This Jesus of Nazareth was impossible. The disciples were all also confused at this time. They did not understand what Jesus was talking about. So they finally say that after he was raised from the dead, that his disciples remembered that he had said and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So the board of the church and the sacramental things that we receive shows who Jesus is. It was in the light of the death and resurrection of the, our Lord Jesus Christ that we can understand this spectacular event. As John had placed this event at the beginning of his gospel to indicate how Jesus had come to replace the former man of worship with the sacramental life of the church, he was also saying something about the nature of the church. What is the church? So he was now giving us and telling us what is the nature of the church. Formerly, the people of God had to be reassured the presence of God by symbols and the people had to gather at shrines symbolized by the lights of the temple. Now they would gain the assurance in Christ himself. We are no longer have assurance on the building. So the assurance of God's presence among us is the risen Christ. Jesus died for our sins and rose again that he might be present among us. Because the risen Christ is present among us in the spirit of God, which God has given to us. The apostle Paul can refer to us as the body of Christ. So the church is the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. When we are gathered together, we are the body of Christ. That is now what the church is. So the church is not the building. Our focus is not on the building. We can worship anywhere. Under a tree is a church. Up the mountain is a church. At the edge of the river is a church. Anywhere we can worship. Because the church is the body of Christ. Thus it was true that the people did train the body of Christ. But he was raised to renew life in three days. And we are now part of that body. So the boast that Jesus made that day in the view of the promise of God and in perfect trust that God would complete them in him are now fulfilled in us. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. So everything has now been fulfilled. What was also important to the evangelist was the sacramental character of the church. So when our Lord talked about the temple of his body, replacing the temple in Jerusalem, that was also true in a sacramental sense. So the sacrificial system that was practiced in the temple at Jerusalem, along with the priestly entrance into the Holy of Holies, were signs of God's grace and means for God's people. So the people did not have to sacrifice themselves, and they were also reminded of God's presence and their access to him. Now, it is the risen Christ who offers his body to us in the Holy Eucharist as the sure sign that has been sacrificed for us and is present with us. So in the giving of that body and blood as we literally feel to in the presence of the risen Christ, together we are his body. So when we take the, the, the sacraments, the bread and the wine, we are receiving Christ. Who is the body? Who is the church? So Luther found it fascinating to talk about us as being baked into one loaf. As we all receive of the same bread, eat the same together, we become one loaf, according to Luther. We are bonded together in this Christ. For us, that means that we are not alone. Not only is God present in us, but we are also present in one another to be a strength and a presence for one another. So we emphasize that we, when we go to the residential homes, Hospitals, bearing bread and wine that have been consecrated in the Eucharist. Sometimes we take these elements to the hospitals, to the residential home, who representing the people or taking to the people who have not been with us in the church building. But already for those who have not been present with us, Christ is present with them in the sacrament. So we are united with them in the body of Christ. We are the members of his body. Later in the gospel, John gives an account of a confrontation between Jesus and a woman of Samaria. When the woman perceived that Jesus was a prophet, he asked him why the difference in attitude of the Samaritans and the Jew. 
who each claimed separate shrines for worshiping God. And Jesus said to him, the hour is coming, and now is, when the worshippers, true worshippers, will worship the Father in spirit and the truth. For such the Father seek to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. John 4, verse 23 and 24. So taken with the Holy Gospel for this day, we should understand that we can never permit buildings, symbols, signs, organizations, traditions, customs, liturgies, or any features of church life or worship to become substitute for our real devotion to our Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot substitute our Lord Jesus Christ with any of those things. So all these things in themselves can become too important. We know how difficult it is to introduce a new book of worship, a new liturgy, a new hymn, or a new custom into the church because people make idols of their traditions. If you try to bring something new, they say we are used to this because they have made, made whatever their tradition become like an idol. So you can't bring anything new into their system. And I say, yes, you can bring new because the sender is not our tradition. The sender is Jesus Christ. When we worship God in spirit and in truth, we know his real presence in us and among us as the risen Christ, who is our real temple, our real altar. So we worship him and adore him when we receive all that he offers us by grace. He is the real temple. He is the real altar. So when we come to him, let us focus on Jesus Christ and nothing else. We dramatize that when we come together for worship and we gather for him to ourselves when we, in faith, we receive him. So, we should remember that the Christian's body in 1 Corinthians, again, he says, chapter 6, that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's why you find that we are, as all Christians, become the church. Just as the Lord was, just Jesus was anxious that the temple in Jerusalem be kept pure. So we must be careful that our bodies be turned over to the Lord for continual cleansing. Why? Because our bodies are the temple for the Holy Spirit. I am not worried if you mess up out there, outside the body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit. But when you mess up in this temple, which is the, the enclosure of the Holy Spirit, you are sinning to God. The whole house must be cleansed if true worship is to be restored. Because we are afraid to sin against our Lord. I have kept your word in my heart so that I will not sin against you. So you keep on reciting the word of God so that you will not sin against God. So brothers and sisters, let us keep this holy temple clean and let us not pollute it with different things. Let us never pollute, pollute it with the things that are necessary. Our focus is on Jesus Christ, who is the Alpha and Omega of our Christian life. If this building is going to be closed today, still we can worship him, because we worship God in spirit and in truth. He is not enclosed in the building. He is everywhere. He is ever present wherever you are. May the good Lord bless you as you think over these words to say God is God with us. God bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you. We pray for our church, for those who worship here today, for those who are away, who are worshiping in their own homes. 
and who find it hard to come to church. May we worship in spirit and in truth and bring glory to God. Let us pray for our community, for those who are housebound, for those who are unemployed, for those who care for others. May they know the presence of God whose son brought healing and salvation. We pray for our country, for those with power to make a difference, for those with authority to act justly, for those who speak for others. May they understand their power and authority and show integrity in all they do. We pray for our world, for those without a voice in the future, for those without dreams, for those who are in despair. May they know the respect of others and may they grow within them. We pray for ourselves, thankful for God, God's goodness, aware of our failings, conscious of our complacence. May the Holy Spirit disturb us and the love of God comfort us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, it's time to make our offerings. As we make our offerings, let us just reflect upon our lives, what God has done to us. Our offerings are a symbol of thanking God. I know we will never thank God enough, but we are able to thank him for what God has done. Just think about the seven days that has gone. What has God done in your life? There are so many things that God has done in your life. Only for these past seven days. And how much you do thank God per day. So brothers and sisters, as you have listened to this message, it is always right and good to thank God. And say thank you Lord. So bring your offering so that I can pray for it right now. Heavenly Father, we pray for these offerings, Lord, as we bring it before you, so that these offerings can be used for your kingdom, so that these offerings can be used for the proclamation of the word of God, so that these offerings can be used for the expansion of your kingdom. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful opportunity that you have given us. May you bless every individual we have managed and remembered to thank you at this right moment. Thank you, Father. Thank you as we bring your offerings. Bless them, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Let us receive grace. Heavenly Father, we come before you. May the God whose temple is creation bless to honor the earth. May the Son whose body becomes the temple Bless us to own our bodies. May the spirit who dwells in us makes us holy. Bless us to own, honor the bodies of those we meet. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen. God bless you.